Can we please show our appreciation for Mr. Tony This is the best reception I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> and you know, in my hometown, uh, you know, they, they say a prophet has no stature in his, in his home, home country. So it's, it's like in my hometown, you know, I'm just Tony Barr. And uh, I, at, I give a talk at the university and people say, who is this guy? So it's nice to get this type of attention. Now, I wanted to say that my dad was from England. He was from Liverpool, and he, 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 left, he left at the age of 16 to go to sea. I, my mother said he, he ran away from home to sea, and he jumped ship in New York City, and my mother married an illegal immigrant. So anyway, I'm so pleased with that uh, circumstance. The... Um, People in, uh, in North Carolina did talk about the lineage of uh, the statistics department. It went, went back to Iowa State, and it went back to the Rothamstad Experiment Station here in England. And Sir Ronald Fisher was the statistician at the Rothamstad Experiment st Station. He, uh, they said, single-mindedly created the fundamentals of statistics. He was into genetics. So he did the genetics to improve crops, and he used statistics. And he invented the analysis of variance, the F Fisher F test. So he's an incredibly important guy. Now they uh, cloned a copy of the Rothamstad Experiment Station at Iowa State University in, um, in America. And that was apparently quite an uh, effective unit. Anyway, here are some of the heavy hitters at Iowa State. This is a picture in 1940. And uh, Gertrude Cox uh, became the head of the statistics department at NC State. Now at Iowa State, they invented the first electronic computer. It was John Adonassoff invented that computer. At the same time, and actually Snedeker did some computing using this computer it used, you call them valves, and uh, had a drum memory. Uh, it didn't have a stored program, but uh, John Adonassoff was the one who invented that. And there's me in 1988 meeting John Adonassoff. It turned out he was a university, he was a Gator graduate, the University of Florida <laughs> graduate. And he went on and got his PhD in physics at Iowa State and built that computer. Well, this is a very important guy in North Carolina, uh, uh, Frank Porter Graham. And he was the head of the university system. And he was on a train in 1940, and he bumped into, just by accident, to a big guy in the, in the United States Department of Agriculture. And they had a discussion, and they said, well, we really need a ag experiment station, a statistical unit to help the farmers in uh, North Carolina. And it, got, it was approved on that uh, chance meeting. And so th they went and uh, wrote Snedeker at Iowa State, who would you recommend to head up a department at NC State? And Snedeker replied in a letter and it with about five names of people he thought were well qualified. And then he said, if you would consider a woman, Gertrude Cox would be great. Anyway, Gertrude Cox became the um, head of the Department of Statistics, the first uh, head of a department uh, in, I guess, probably the, well, at least at NC State, the first female head. She was the head of the department when I went to work uh, there, and uh, I, I worked with her only on one project, and that was the first time they'd ever used the computer to publish the directory of the Biometric Society. Now, in those days, to get, you didn't have, you just had a line printer, so you'd do bold by printing three times, you'd, you'd do, have to overprint the underscore and whatever, 
And Gertrude Cox was a very big stickler at that. I mean, it was, it was she, she made sure that I got everything exactly right. Well, Gertrude Cox actually showed a picture something like this at one of the talks. And she said, well, these were all my computers. So she had lots of computers. Now, this was, com this was statistical computing up until 1958. And it was really statistical computing sometime after that. But in 1958, they introduced the uh, IBM uh, 650 uh, computer. That's me from high school. And this is what my fellow students said. So I was listed as inventor, original ways of doing physics problem. So I went off to NC State. And this is their, lo their motto is think and do. I am just blown away. That's exactly what I would choose to have as a motto. Well, I was not a good student. And so I dropped out and became a student trainee at the White Sands Missile Range out in New Mexico. And this is pretty much how it looked there. Um, now I was on the monitoring range and they didn't have this up and going, but the idea was we were supposed to monitor everybody's telemetry and make sure that people weren't, two people weren't using the same frequency. I just couldn't imagine just sitting listening the radio writing these things down. But I never had to do that because they, they never had it functioning. They had uh, three civilians and five soldiers, and I really never saw them do anything. But uh, my friends told me that they were programming on the new transistorized computer, the scientific computer. So I went over and talked to the lady, and she said, oh, you, we would be glad to have you work here, but you gotta talk to the, the, your supervisor. So I went and talked to him. He said, well, I don't know. Talk to the branch manager. I don't know. Talk to the division manager. Talk to the division manager and says, well, we need you on the monitoring station. So I quit. <laughs> and then, then I came in the last day, Friday, with my suitcase to work because, you know, I was staying at New Mexico State University and they had the bus to get us there and I wanted to go down to El Paso and thumb my way home. So they had a military head of the, of the, the uh, division, and he invited me in, and he said, why didn't you come and speak to me? But you know, I've, I've checked out of the dorm. <laughs> I've uh, checked out of, anyway, uh, I went, went home. Well, when I went back to NC State, uh, I had a completely new attitude. I took responsibility for my grades, and I just, thought, I'm going to do everything I can to get good grades. But I still had to have a job, always had to have a job, because my parents paid for tuition and everything else I had to pay for. So I thought it'd be one, wonderful to program uh, the computer. And this was the computer they had, the 650. Now, if you look at this computer, it, they have the punch card reader and the punch, the reader punch. This is the only I.O. you had with this computer. So a, you, you, would, you would punch the cards out and you'd take them over to a tabulating machine. You put a special board in there and it, it would, you could print your analysis of variance result. But uh, it was a two-step process. I've got a book. I spent the whole weekend learning the book and I couldn't get a job, the long and the short of it. When I became a grad student, this is two years later, they solicited people to program their new computer that was coming. And the computer was not there, but it was coming. So I got the job, and the very first thing they did is say, we need an analysis of variance program. So there were three people who were supposed to be doing this. And after three weeks, I was the only one left because all we got was a list of instructions and uh, here, look at this textbook, and you can talk to Dr. Grandage. And, uh, but anyway, I loved, loved doing it, but it was all, what I would do is code up the program on coding sheets, go over and have them key punch it, get a listing, single step through it. And it was all mental exercise to, to, to debug the program. So the computer didn't come in till March. Well, actually it's supposed to come in March. I think it came in April. And, uh, they put it in this building here, the textile building. 
now I um, had access to a key punch because it used to be that I would have to say, pretty please, could you punch these cards for me? Uh, they wouldn't let me get close to the key punch. Now I could get close to the key punch. And I could work there nights and whatever. So anyway, I, uh, and I could test my program on the computer. Now, this is the, always was one of the biggest downers of my career. I had um, probably 2,400 cards that, it, that I had collected. It was more, a box and a half worth of cards. There's about that many cards in the program. So I put it in. I got all these little letters on this, the listing, the assembly listing, and I went over to the, some guy who, who had programmed the 650. I said, well, what is this? And so Hank Hamilton said, those are flags. Each one is an error. I said, if you had made these errors in industry, they would have, would have fired you. That was, that was my first, that was my first uh, user support type uh, thing. But, uh, I, I fixed those things and I got the program. Now, I had a real problem because I had a summer fellowship at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. I thought, I'm gonna be an oceanographer. But uh, I had to get that program done by June 1. And I was working night and day and the finally, the last Sunday, probably at seven o'clock in the morning, it worked. I went back to the room, put a sheet on the floor, threw all my stuff, put it on my back, and got in the car, and we drove north. And I uh, fell asleep in Raleigh, woke up in Baltimore. So this is probably six or seven hours later. Well, the second year I did their regression program, multiple regression, and they'd gotten a floating point hardware addition to the computer. Now this computer was 100, thousand characters, not, it was a business computer, and so it worked with characters, not binary. Now, these two programs constituted 90% of what they did with the computer. So they shared these programs with the university statisticians of the Southeast Experiment Station, all in the Southeastern America, these were used. Well, I got my master's in physics, and uh, I, chose to go to the Pentagon. We're going to put all the military information into the computer. What a goal this was. I thought this would be a fantastic job. So um, my, I believe my office was right below here. <laughs> this is a three-story room underneath the parking lot. You, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't believe, obviously no windows. I loved that, that job and uh, I, they asked me to do a program so they could do queries. You walk up to the, the typewriter and it would, the idea is to roll everything out of the computer, roll a retrieval program in, and put the answer out on, on the, the, the operator console. So I wrote a retrieval program that had the and and the ors, but it had something you don't see ordinarily. It had a circle search so you could find all the points with the UTM coordinates within a circle. And it also did a, a polygon search so you could find, uh, if you had a shape, you could find the, t the pictures from space that were uh, uh, germane. Well, I had only just finished this thing, and uh, Robert Kennedy uh, phones over to the Pentagon and says, how many sorties have we had over the Haiphong Harbor in the last 60 days or something like that? And they gave him the answer. And Robert Kennedy sent a thank you to the uh, Pentagon, to the National Military Command Support Center, which is what, who we, we, we operated with, so he sent a thank you letter. Um, I wish I had got, uh, gotten a copy of that letter, but uh, the powers to be got that. And um, now I, I just have to tell you about the, um, that they had the MITRE Corporation as checking up on IBM. 
and the MITRE Corporation found a bug in my program. And, you know, I thought I had debugged it pretty good. But the deal was that, uh, you know, the world's a big globe. And so I put a circle around, let's say, I think they did circle around Washington, D.C. And uh, they found that sure enough, if it was outside the circle, it, it didn't have a hit inside the circle, it did. But it also found that over on the other side of the earth in Melbourne, that it was, essentially I had done a cylinder that went through the earth. So. It was just a little if statement to fix that program problem, but <laughs> that, that was totally unexpected for me. Here is uh, a, something I got out of the uh, uh, ACM on databases about the, some history of, uh, or the genealogy of databases. And you can see the formatted file system where the red line starts, that's what we worked on and it had the self-defining file concept. And I thought, well, if I had had this back at NC State, I would have had a dynamite system. You know, I, um, I wrote several programs that hooked into the uh, self-defining file. And one of them was the hierarchy program that sorted the whole status of forces thing by Joint Chiefs of Staff, Army, Navy, Air Force, underneath the Army, First Army, Second Army, Third Army. Anyway, it was, it, it was uh, uh, never had been done before. Now, the thing is, they were moving from card punch. So I found that one-sixth of the data for operational commander was wrong. I mean, this is, you know, they were just transitioning from the key punch, from the old cards in this, this time. Well, in 65, well, this is probably 66. 65, IBM announced the IBM 360, revolutionary architecture. And that's the type of computer that I start, started programming SAS on. The, the manuals appeared at, at the Pentagon. And I looked at the PL1 manual and I said, boy, this is a marvelous thing. You could, a uniform lexicon for the whole language. So I could, you could write one lexical analyzer for the whole language. In Fortran, they had, it was klutzy. <coughs> you had a separate thing for the format statement, this separate thing for other different parts of the language. But not true with the PL1. But, so this was a, some, something where the SAS lexicon comes from, is the PL1. After I'm working for about a year and a half, my manager says to me, Tony, You've written half the programs of the six-man crew. I can't have this anymore. I, I've got to spread the work around. So he put me into a, you know, shoved me upstairs, so to speak, and told me, come back with a solution for how to sh two mainframes are going to share one common disk. Now, I, I didn't have the background to do that. So I'm just doing nothing. And my old boss at uh, NC State calls and says, can you come back and rewrite the analysis of variance and regression program for the uh, IBM 360? So I said, well, you know, I've already been thinking about that. So I went back and the SAS project was formed. Now it's kind of a thing that might not be in your mind, but you know, I told people I'm gonna build a, a system. And all they had in mind was the analysis of variance and regression program rewritten. The idea of a system or a language, that was just outside of the domain of these people's minds. I mean, it took years before people understood the, that paradigm. Well, anyway, my goal was to bring uh, statistics to researchers and students. I think I've done that. So, uh, and I, these were just some little th thoughts. The simplest case should be simply expressed. Then the more you move on to the more complicated cases. Uh, so you wouldn't force the new user to, to have to learn a, a complicated case to get any work done. And a number is a number. That was my theme. And uh, I, the missing values, 
to be handled elegantly. I think that's an idea I picked up later on, but I was very proud of that. I started working on the analysis of variance, the input statement, and uh, with, the, with the analysis of variance, I've done the uh, classes statement and the model statement. Well, there was this fellow, uh, they called him Curly Lucas. That was because he didn't have any hair. And Curly Lucas was the master of the general linear models. And Jim Goodnight was a student, a PhD student, and he worked for Curly Lucas. And he do the, he would generate the dummy variables. Each program was a one-off program to generate the dummy variables that you would throw into the regression algorithm and do the general linear models. So I talked to Jim and I said, hey, I've already done the, uh, the, the classes statement, the model statement. I'll get the dummy variables together and you can do the matrix stuff and and Jim actually was an unbelievable perfectionist in making the output look good on a line printer output. So anyway, so Jim started working, and that product, the general linear models, was we were the only people in the world who had a production-oriented program for doing that. So that brought all the pharmaceutical people to us. Now, in the general, the ANOVA, was ideal for agricultural experiments, but you had to have an equal number of observations in every um, cell. The, but you know, in a pharmaceutical thing, you got patients died, patients moved, patients too sick to take the medicine, so you had unbalanced designs. So the pharmaceutical people just, they needed this program, and. It, the program was completed probably in uh, 1970. In 73, uh, the Supreme Court said that the FDA had uh, the power to impose uh, good manufacturing processes and whatever, the whole, all, everything that they do do. So, the, our program was much in demand in the pharmaceutical world. Now here's the first manual that we had that was printed in a printing place. I got the logo, I mean I named it SAS, but I got the logo from a National Geographic uh, picture of a Scandinavian Airlines and uh, <laughs> that was that we would get a bulletin from the Triangle University's Computing Center, and that was the other th part of that. Now, this, I had a, I told everybody, well, we need a new logo. And so, and so nobody came up with one. I came up with this one, and this was the SAS logo for many, many years. And this was the SAS 72 manual, the first manual that was um, semi professional, we'll say. It was a good manual. Now Barry Merrill comes along in 73, and he's working on his PhD in Illinois, and he's doing computer performance evaluation. And he's, he needed a statistical tool, and he wanted, he's, he got SAS. I think at that time it might have been given away for free. This opened an entirely new market for us, because computer performance evaluation. You have a million dollar or a million and a half dollar computer, you want to make sure that you have the right resources, the amount of disk drive, the amount of memory. So uh, the software was uh, a very good match for this. And it was also a good match because of the power of the input statement, especially that cursor that you, were, you can skip around so you could do repeated fields. Barry uh, put us on the map with the share IBM share people. Now also in 73, we had an incredible experience. You know, in those days, to make a out-of-state call was expensive. I didn't call my mother very often. She wanted me to write him, write her. But I pick up the phone at the office, and the fellow says, I'm Fernando Alguien, and I'm with IBM uh, Mexico. I'm calling from uh, uh, Mexico City. Uh, we're very interested in your SAS product. Uh, could you uh, could we get a copy? Sure. 
could you install it for us? I said, well, we, we never install it for people. We just send it and they install it. He said, but could you? And so uh, I talked to the head of the department and that was a Tuesday. On Thursday, Fernando was in town and he escorts us down to uh, Mexico City because he wanted Norman Borlaug. He got the Nobel Prize for the Green Revolution. He wanted Norman Borlaug's unit to be used, a high visibility, prestigious uh, site to use the SAS product. Well, anyway, this really made me feel uh, like I feel today. <laughs> you know, accepted, whatever, appreciated. Also in 73, John came, and John was a grad student in economics and slash statistics. He took courses in both places. He was gonna get his PhD. I don't think he ever did finish his PhD, but he's the most productive programmer I've ever seen in my life. And he would just tear into something, and he was uh, mathematically inclined, and so he did a countless uh, econ econometric and statistical programs. He did the matrix language. And I, I just sh share that this is, um, to me, it's, it's just so, so weird, but it's just the way life happens. Uh, I got married in, back in 75, and I took off for uh, Jamaica for the honeymoon. And I come back, and John says, look at this matrix algebra I put together. And I said to him, well, John, that's great, but it's not SAS. And what I meant, what I meant was it, it, wasn't, it wasn't for the masses. It was really for the masters and PhD students. So, but John actually never forgave me for that particular comment, but uh, it was just my thought. We came out with SAS 76. Now, in 72, I felt that, you know, it was a learning experience always, you know, I rewrite things, whatever, but in 72, I felt that the software was need, in need of new ar a new architecture. Really meant that to rewrite all the code that I did. Now, I did all of my work, uh, the language work, in assembler. Now, people don't uh, quite appreciate this, but uh, back then, I think we got, in 76, we got up to where you could run a 300K program without spending too much money. But memory was very precious. I wrote it in assembler to keep it small. And then for the 76, I wrote it in a reentrant assembler. Now when you run a compiler and get your C program out, it's, it's all reentrant code. You don't even think about it. But back then, this was a novel thing. And to do it in assembler was a it was a learning experience, but I rewrote all the interfaces. I thought it was going to take two years. It took four years. That was a grueling experience. Now, I just thought I, this came out of the SAS 76 manual, and it's just the, the things that I, I, I did and, and Jim Goodnight did and John Saul. And you can see how John came after the 72 version. So I initially did, uh, uh, some procedures and I turned them over to other people. Now somebody said, to, I guess Alan said, did you do the sort? Well, I said, yes I did, but I think Alan's thinking something completely different because when I did the sort, it was hooking into sync sort or some third party sort that everybody was using to sort big files. I'm sure uh, SAS has got its own sort algorithms and uh, doesn't use sync sort anymore. I, I forgot to say, back in the uh, 72 version, I guess the merge was introduced. And at that time, I felt that the researchers could finally do all their work inside of SAS because you really needed the merge to do, you know, when you're combining different data sets together. Uh, I was telling Alan how uh, that, you know, when I went to work, you know, their expectations was just to have their head counts, so to speak. Well, the head of the department would send me over to see this Dr. Legates, and Dr. Legates was a famous animal scientist, and Dr. Legates always wanted me to sort the dams and the daughters. 
because he wanted to see the breed, effect of breeding getting more milk production out of the, uh, the daughters than the dams. So this was a, uh, something I'd been through a lot of, lot of merging. And actually, th that was the reason why I call it merge, because in back, we used to use tape files and we merge them together, but the join is, is the language of uh, the database world. Well, anyway, I just thought these differentiators of SAS versus the others were uh, fast and small, all file formats, report writing. You know, when I did the report writing, I, I was the only one who was the initiator of it. N nobody said, oh, we need a report writer. The point there is, I just see w what it takes to get the job done, and you gotta do reports. It's just not all statistics, right? You gotta show, give a report saying, here's, here's all these exceptions that we gotta fix in the data. The date and time of putting those literals into the program, I thought that that was a, uh, a, a, a linguistic contribution of mine. You, you could extend the compiler at the procedure level. So you didn't, you could write new procedures with new languages to describe the details of that procedure quite easily. And the, the last thing is good diagnostic messages. Since I was doing a hell of a lot of support, I wanted very good messages so they didn't come back on me. Well, in 76, we moved to this uh, facility across the street from the, from, from the campus. And this is the four of us, how we divided up the uh, ownership. Well, anyway, in 79, I said goodbye. Now, it's kind of an interesting thing. People ask about, uh, well, did you get a good, good buyout, whatever? And I, I said, well, you know, I wrote the, the incorporation articles. And I wrote what it would be, you know, your percentage of the profit for the last two years. So I ate my own dog food, so to speak. You know, it was my, my agreement. So I got a fair price. I was the one who, who, who stated it, never thinking that I was going to be the one to leave. Well, I, I'm completely jumping into a new talk here because I think understanding has been a, a theme of my life. And I think it is... Uh, really a vital part of everybody's uh, needs is to understand. And our wealth, I think, is all based upon how, how knowledgeable our citizens are. So this tree is actually not too far from where I live. And I, I, my wife and I shot this picture called the Treaty Oak in um, Jacksonville. Leonardo da Vinci said, the noblest pleasure is the joy of understanding. It can't be any more powerful statement than that. Now, what is the starting point? I've, I just found this to be, you know, Genesis says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it is, is in language, is, is, is where it all starts, according to the Bible. Now, Kirsten Guy, Nygaard said, to program is to understand. He's one of the co-inventors of object-oriented programming. And it's also, you could say, he's, he's like the Ben Franklin of Norway. He did so many interesting things, politically and in uh, different domains of knowledge. Uh, I, actually, I wish that I'd known about object-oriented programming back in those days, but I didn't. I am maybe stuck in an endless loop because I have obsessed over the self-defining file and self-definition. And here's the ultimate uh, self-defining thing. You know, Moses asks uh, God at the burning bush, who are you? I am that I am. So I am who I say I am. Uh, this is a Florida sculpture did this, this thing to express his own, creating his own world, his, his life struggle. So. That's a self-defining man, right? Now, every cell in our body is self-defining. You know, we, they're capable of, oh, you know, I wouldn't say every cell I mean, in our body is, but um, with coaxing, I guess, every cell in our body can uh, create a new clone of itself.
I, I just love this particular book, To Thine Own Self Be True. It's obviously a Shakespeare's term. You know, if you, we'll never know the truth, but we ought to be able to be true to ourselves. In other words, if we have a self-defining thing, it defines itself, and if it doesn't break anyway, it, it will be true to itself. How do you define the interpretation of an instruction? Now, my feeling is the simplest way that you can describe it is to have a, a program, it's written in instructions, interpret an instruction, because it's, it's all full of instructions itself. So you, you know, essentially you can use the system to, de to define its own interpretation. So in my model that I work on, I have computer as a function, or, or as a program, that has an argument of an instruction, and so it interprets it, and then you know how the computer works, so you know, the computer defines computer interpreting a, a computer, whatever. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a way that you, you can answer every question. Uh, this is uh, Kirk Girdle. He was an incredibly famous mathematician. I guess at the age of 20 or 21, he uh, made this proof uh, and he, 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 the title of his paper was on formally undecidable propositions of Principia Mathematica and related systems. And it was a direct attack on Bertrand Russell and Albert Northhead Whitehead. And I, a friend of mine said, well, you know, Bertrand Russell had a uh, mental breakdown for, for a depression for, for 10 years after that because he had spent 10 years working on Principia Mathematica Girdle, at this young 21, 22 year old, proved it couldn't be done. A lot of people say no system can be consistent and complete. And they're, they're, what they're trying to say is there can be no truth or truth is relative or whatever. And so it's, a, it's actually an ugly thing in my mind to say. Uh, so the popular way people say no system be consistent and complete. I talk to mathematicians, they tell me that. But the correct way of stating it, no system defined by syntax can be consistent and complete. So essentially, syntactical ambiguity will always give us problems. So my, this is my pitch for we shouldn't use syntax. <laughs> I found this book to be pretty damn interesting. After Einstein died, Kirk Girdle became buddies with uh, Ho Wang. Ho Wang was a mathematician and a computer scientist, actually. He came to America in 46 and got his PhD at MIT and stayed there. And it's a after Einstein died, Girdle became best buddies with uh, Ho Wang. And it turned out that Kirk Girdle didn't even believe his own theorem. The, the point is he thought mathematicians could be, think bigger thoughts than could be defined by syntax. And it was, he said that he was a Platonist, Plat Platonist. And essentially, Plato talked about forms and objects. It's really the type and object model. Now also in this book, page 207, there was a section where he, he says, well, you know, you can, you can um, take set theory and take the word set and replace it with the concept of a set, a concept of a concept, and you can define all of logic with that. Now, I'm, I'm not a student of logic, but uh, I, I like that idea, concept of a concept, a self-defining thing. It's a concept, and it's the concept. It defines itself. So um, I, it has influenced me to change my language well, it's a self-defining object. The, my view is that we, in mathematics, in computer science, we've used the language of math. That's where science was first taught, is in the math department. And so we always talk about a variable, and the bizarre thing, of we talk about a, a variable, this variable is a constant. Isn't that bizarre to, to hear that said? Now, then you go to object-oriented programming and then you have um, the idea of methods being part of the type. 
It's, it seemed to me a not very symmetric type of language, but the long and the short is I think the correct language is to talk about connections. And there's four types of connections that I've identified. There are the connections where um, uh, every object can have a variable, let's say age, if it's talking about a person, every object can have a different uh, value. Uh, however, if it's, it, you can also have a uniform connection, which means that essentially every, you see the same thing for every variable. Now, let's say you're doing, uh, uh, have a presentation function for presenting a number. Well, every number would use the same presentation function. It'd be a uniform connection. Then you got global connections. It's pretty obvious. There's one copy of the of the. It connects to to one object. And parameters we need to do functions and programs. This is just kind of the proof that concept and connection is the correct language. If you go to Amazon and put concept and connection in, you may get a hundred books. There are biology concepts and connections, history concepts and connections. That's the language that uh, we use to represent knowledge. Why don't we use this language in our programming languages? Then you, you look at our brain and I don't know, 10 to the 10th neurons, and each one's got 7,000 connections to another. So it gets to be like 10, 10 to the 14th connections that are in our mind. Well, our mind is, is you, if a neuron is a concept, uh, maybe that's a stretch, but uh, uh, it's all concept and connection. Now this is Leonardo da Vinci's mind. And he was fond of drawing maps, uh, which were, um, he had connections to other concepts. And there is the two terms, there's the, the term mind map and concept map. There's two schools of these things. But my view is this is the correct way to think about computer science, that we, we have uh, the, um, well, two views of the world. We've got the view of objects that we see. I see all you people, you're all objects. But then you've got the hidden uh, world, which is the concept. I see the concept of people, the concept of a chair, the concept of a light. That's a, a different world that we don't really have pictures of in general. Um, it would be great if we could do pictures of all the concepts, but uh, I'm going to digress here and just tell you that there are two paradoxes that always struck me. I read Data and Reality back in 1980, and in that book he spent three pages saying, well, isn't it strange the scheme is always separate from the, from the objects? Then I went to Bertrand Meyer's course. He's the guy who wrote the first object-oriented programming book. And he's dancing around the first day, making jokes and whatever, the first morning in Zurich. And he says, well, look at that program. There are only types there. You've got to run the program to get the objects. These are kind of interesting uh, points that we, we do naturally separate the, the types and the objects of the schema and the objects. And in my world, I'm sort of putting them all back together again, I, I believe, or at least making the this distinction explicit. Now, in the concept of a concept, uh, there would be a global connection to the world. And the global connection to the world would be the list of people, the list of companies, the list of educational institutions. Doesn't this look like uh, .com, .edu, .gov? Anyway, this is the, could be the starting point for uh, a model of reality. Ludwig Wittgenstein's pretty well-respected philosopher. He wrote a whole book and said we think in terms of pictures. So I think that's the future is pictures. Twelve-year-olds are learning to program with pictures. Millions and millions of them. They don't have to think very much with pictures. 
They don't have left friends and right friends and operator precedents. So um, it's, a, it's a simpler paradigm. Uh, I think this is the way the world ought to go. The last thing is that the movie Tron was written by a systems programmer and Jeff Bridges went into the computer and walked around in it. We ought to be able to navigate through all structured knowledge and uh, be able to read it if we have permission to go into to that area. Um, this, is, this is my uh, conclusion. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. My name is Vasily, I'm a proud member of Suguki. Um, question, with your wealth of experience, what do you think the future holds for programming, for working with data? What would you say in the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? You came all the way from punch cards. What's next? <laughs> well, this is sort of my own thinking is we, we're living in a t Tower of Babel, and it's somewhat crazy in my mind. Uh, all these different databases, the different uh, languages, um, the presentation, you know, the HTML, whatever. We're, we're living in a chaotic world the world wants understanding. And if one did bring understanding uh, to the world, people would go to it and they, they would say in their company, why don't we do it like that other company? Everybody over there understands what's going on. So <clears throat> I mentioned that scratch language because 12 year olds are learning how to do that. I'll give you a scenario which I you know, I, I just dream, I mean, <clears throat> I'm a, I'm, it's just myself and my, my ideas, but um, the, I, I, I'll actually just tell you the, the way this uh, played out in my mind. Uh, a friend of mine said that uh, SAS got into real problems about seven years ago because they started charging for uh, academics for SAS. And they all jumped ship to R. And now it's just hard to get them back. Now, I slept on that, and I got up and I thought, well, you know, you could really think about that. You know, if you brought out a tool that explained all of computing, you know, I, I didn't show you my interpreter that the computer interprets down to the bit level and that there's a, a, one, a, a one, one bit computer essentially is a vector just one bit wide that I map everything down on. It's an incredibly precise definition of everything. Well, if you came out with a product for 12 year olds that would present computing where they could do real computing then you could gradually make the product more richer so that it got, by the time they got four, six years, it's only six years till they get to, to uh, college, right? 18, then, then you, if you had the Excel type uh, uh, spreadsheets things and they could do real homework assignments, then it's only four years till they're out in the world and then if you could have at least small companies have their own enterprise model in it. Then you get the small companies in and gradually uh, you, you step it up. Now the incredible, in my mind, the incredible, incredible force of understanding is something which would drive people to, to this type of an environment. So that's my <clears throat> What I say to myself, anyway, is, is how one could change the world in 20 years to have all structured knowledge uh, stored in a uniform way 
Of course, you have an authority structure. You know, you'd have to ask permission to, to look at data just like you have with the, the web right now. Be an alternate to the web for structured knowledge. Now, if you think of the web, at the bottom it is a database these days. Then you have your business rules and then your presentation on top. So wouldn't it be more wonderful if we had a, a coherent way that that was all done? So that's my crystal ball for the future. Let, let me jump to a different thought. You, you triggered a different thought in my mind. And that is, you know, I'm an amateur student of philosophy. And philosophers are really stuck, in my mind, I mean, we've got 6,000 years of tradition of uh, written language, syntactical defined language. So they are always talking about sentences and what the meaning of this is. And they're not talking about uh, objects. You know, the, the, our mind, I think, just uh, separates the uniform information from the variable information. And I, I think it, it, you can have an alternative world uh, to the current philosophy, psychology, from what we have right now. That, that's my, I mean, I, I've just dream, I mean, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Woo!